In this lecture, we're going to review the etiologies of cirrhosis. My advanced organizer and the way I remember these things may not be the most politically correct. I'm probably going to offend some of you, but they work. So if you want to get the test question right, come test day, follow along. Begins, you know the phrase, shit happens. Well, I think uh, VWs are pretty shitty cars. So through the transitive property, VW happens. Now, it may not be true of the company, but it makes the mnemonic work. VW happens is my approach to cirrhosis. And that stands for viral hepatitis B and C has to be chronic, Wilson's disease, hemochromatosis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, primary sclerosing cholangitis, primary biliary cirrhosis, alcohol or ethanol, the NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, also called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And then, because no mnemonic is complete without something like this, the S is for something else, because this is not an all-inclusive list. What I want you to do is be able to associate each of these diseases with the pathology, the patient presentation, the diagnostic step, and what to avoid, and then treatment. In regards to treatment, is it curative of the disease, or are you only treating the cirrhosis with a transplant? All of these diseases, once you reach the stage of cirrhosis, can be fixed with a transplant. By that I mean the cirrhosis can be fixed with a transplant. Some of these diseases are problems with the liver, and so transplanting the liver fixes the disease before the cirrhosis develops. Pay attention to that as well. Let's start off with the viral hepatitis. You have to have chronic inflammation. Which means you have to have had it for a long time. The patients that get hepatitis C are going to be those who use intravenous drugs. The people who get hepatitis B are people who have sex, particularly with prostitutes or sex workers. Yes, both of them are transmitted via blood. Yes, in Southeast Asia, there's vertical transmission of hepatitis B. But when you see a vignette, what I want you to think, hepatitis C, intravenous drug use, hepatitis B, sex workers, and blood transfusions for both. To diagnose hepatitis, and we'll talk more about this in the hepatitis lecture, you get the antibodies. You look for hepatitis C antibody or hepatitis B antibody. Now, because the hepatitis B incidence is so low in the United States, we don't really have very good therapies for it. It's much more prevalent in Southeast Asia. But hepatitis C, and especially in recent years, has gained a lot of attention. So we can now cure hepatitis C. It used to be ribavirin and interferon. Made people feel like crap. You had the flu for a year, and maybe you got it cleared. But now we have the direct acting antagonists, which can effectively cure hepatitis C. So if you have C, you're a good candidate, you get put on these drugs, you're cured of C, you never get the cirrhosis. And you can transplant them, right? because it's cirrhosis. But transplant, I'm going to cross off for hepatitis, because if they have hepatitis C and you transplant them, the transplanted liver will get hepatitis C. So generally, you want to cure them of C before you transplant. All right, that's hepatitis. Let's talk about Wilson's disease. Wilson's disease is a problem with copper deposition. And where the copper goes will determine what symptoms the patient has. In Wilson's disease, you'll have deposition in the basal ganglia. This leads to chorea. You'll have deposition in the liver. That leads to cirrhosis. And you'll have deposition in the eyes, which leads to the Kaiser-Fleischer rings. The way this is going to be given to you on test day is it's a question about cirrhosis and there's a picture of an eye. It's Wilson's disease. There's only one of these diseases that can be diagnosed on eye exam. 
or they're going to ask you to do the eye exam when they tell you something about copper. If they haven't given it to you already, the first test to do is a slit lamp. If you see the Kaiser Fleischer rings, diagnosis is done. But because they know you know this is a disorder of copper, they're going to throw that out there at you. Why don't you just check a serum copper? That is wrong. Never pick serum copper. Instead, what you can do is check seroplasmin or urinary copper. But the best test is going to be a biopsy, which shows you an increased copper. This is a disorder of the liver. So if you transplant it, you reverse the disease. But sometimes all you want to do is get rid of the copper. And you can get rid of copper with penicillamine. So while they're waiting for a transplant, treat the copper overload. Hemochromatosis, much like Wilson's disease, is a disorder of a mineral, and that is iron. Normally, there's a switch in your gut that says, no more iron needs to come in. Your body cannot eliminate iron except through bleeding. And normally, the gut prevents iron from coming in from the gut. In this disorder, it's genetic. There's no off switch. So as much iron as you eat comes into the gut. Because there's no way to get iron out of your body, if you take in too much, you get overloaded. And so this has a problem with iron overload and deposition. You're looking for the patient with bronze diabetes. That is, they have hyperpigmented skin, iron in their skin, they have diabetes, iron in their pancreas, and they have cirrhosis. Also look out for diastolic CHF. Bronze diabetes. How can you tell the difference between the person who's got a tan and happens to have diabetes and bronze diabetes? The answer is the person with the tan is sitting in front of you in clinic. The person with bronze diabetes is on the test. This is not a very common disorder. But if you see bronze diabetes, they know you know it's a disorder of iron. So they're going to put iron out there, just like they did copper. It's wrong. The first test you should get is a ferritin. And a ferritin greater than 1,000, in the absence of inflammation or hepatic necrosis, is largely suggestive of hemochromatosis. Now, they will not make you choose between the two of them, but just in case they do, the transferrin saturation greater than 50% is better. But often the ferritin is what they're going to give you to tell you, hey, this is hemochromatosis. The best test is a biopsy. And it's going to show you an increased iron. And you know that this is a genetic disease, HFV mutation. So they're going to throw that out there too. The problem is that hemochromatosis, iron overload, can be caused by more than just that mutation. So testing the genes for a gene mutation is not important. What's important instead is diagnosing this person as having hemochromatosis. And you can do a couple of things. Like penicillamine, there's a chelator. You can undo the iron from me. D for oxamine, undo the iron from me. It's a medication. But the best thing to do, the mainstay of therapy, is bloodletting. You do phlebotomy. Remember, these patients have plenty of iron. They're not bleeding. The only way to get iron out of your body is to bleed. If you have too much iron, you just bleed it out. Your bone marrow will use the iron to make more red blood cells. That's actually the mainstay of therapy. Do phlebotomy to reduce the need for transplant, and you can use divaroxamine as a medication. If they develop cirrhosis, you can transplant. But the disorder's in the gut, not in the liver, so transplant will not cure the hemochromatosis, and the iron will redeposit in the new liver. Alpha-1 and a trypsin deficiency goes something like this. In your lung, there is elastase, which breaks stuff down, and alpha-1 and a trypsin, which says, no, don't do that. And what the idea is, is that, well, you, if you have nasty stuff in there, you want to break it down. But eventually, you want to say, okay, there's no more nasty stuff, let the lungs be. In alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, alpha-1 antitrypsin can't get out of the liver where it's made. If it can't get out of the liver, it can't get to the lungs, which means the elastase goes crazy. So in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, you have all the alpha-1 antitrypsin stuck in the liver. When you have accumulation of something in the body, it goes wrong. That leads to cirrhosis. 
the elastase going crazy in the lungs causes COPD. What you're looking for in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is really young COPD with a small smoking history and cirrhosis. The diagnosis is made by biopsy, and you'll see PAS positive macrophages. The treatment is transplant. While the damage to the lung is already done, because it's a problem with the liver, if you transplant this patient, you give them a new liver, the alpha-1 antitrypsin can get out, and you prevent further degradation of the lung. Now, PSC and PBC cause people a lot of trouble because they both begin and end with the same letter. So how do you tell them apart? I told you I was going to offend you. This is where it's going to happen. Not yet. Once we get to the PBC, you'll see what I mean. All right. Primary sclerosing cholangitis, PSC dudes. Now, men, they go hunting. They kill the boar. They drag it back to the village and they feed the tribe. They are not subtle. Not subtle means extrahepatic disease. You'll be able to see it. It is easy to spot. Men, not subtle, extrahepatic disease. They're going to present with pruritus, jaundice, a pain less jaundice to differentiate it from gallstone disease, and they'll be 30 to 50 years old. One question they like to ask is its association with ulcerative colitis or inflammatory bowel disease in general. You will know that PSC is associated with ANCA, but even if the ANCA is negative, it can still be PSC, so don't pick ANCA. Remember, men, not subtle, extrahepatic disease, you should be able to see it on imaging. What you want to do as the first test is an MRCP, Magnetic Resonance Imaging of the Cholangiopancreatography, MRI of the biliary tree. What you'll see is beads on a string. If you see beads on a string on the MRI, you have the diagnosis and no biopsy is required. You do not have to do an ERCP. You can do the ERCP with the camera down the throat, up the duodenum, and then would actually then take a piece. This allows you to get a biopsy. If you do get a biopsy, it will show onion skin fibrosis. The beads on the string are just a series of strictures. And you might think, well, I could just stent those open. Never stent PSC. The only treatment is transplant. And if you put a stent in, you do get temporary relief. The bile flows. You're not as yellow, not as jaundiced, you're not as itchy. But when the surgeon goes in there to try to reconnect the new liver, they've got a metal stent in there they have to deal with, and it makes the transplant harder. Don't stent PSC. If you need to treat with medications while they're awaiting transplant, ursodeoxycholic acid. All right, take PSC and compare it to PBC. PSC, men, not subtle, extrahepatic, imaging positive. PBC, chicks. PBC, primary biliary cirrhosis, B is for bitches. B is for bitches, women. Women are subtle, they're coy. Intrahepatic ducts. No association with UC bowel disease. I told you I was going to offend you, but this works. B is for bitches, S is for sons of bitches. These women are going to present with pruritus, jaundice, and B between 30 and 50 years old. You are going to get imaging, and the imaging is going to be normal. No ducts will be dilated. There won't be bees on the string. Nothing will be positive. If you're savvy enough to spot it, you might get an AMA in order to try to diagnose it with serology. But the only way to diagnose this condition, because women are coy and it's intrahepatic and subtle, you have to get a biopsy. And the only treatment we have is transplant. You may not like it, but I bet it works. Now, if you're getting burned out, because this is a long lecture, I know, the last two are really easy. 
I did that on purpose. Alcoholic cirrhosis is caused by alcohol, chronic alcohol use. They're going to have a long history of alcohol use. You're going to say, hey, did you drink, drink alcohol in your life? They're going to say yes. And you say, well, you've got cirrhosis. You should probably stop doing that. And if they stop doing that, which is one of the criteria for a transplant, a transplant is curative. And NASH and NAFL are essentially the waste paper basket. Yes, fat people get fatty livers, but NASH is really the thing that says, well, they have cirrhosis and they don't have any of these other things, so uh, NASH. They didn't do anything, there's no, no history, everything else is negative, and they have cirrhosis anyway, so you need to transplant them. And of course, the S means there's something else because there's other things that can cause hepatic necrosis and more things that lead to chronic inflammation that leads to cirrhosis. That is cirrhosis.